Assalamu alaikum. Uh, there were two purposes for sharing that video with you. One was to share the message, obviously. We are all reeling from the events uh, that took place uh, in Paris, unfortunately, last night. Uh, the consequences are going to be very serious, I, I can assure you that. Uh, the best thing would be just another war. But for example, the, one of the biggest consequences could be uh, that Europe might reverse its posture towards Syrian refugees. They're already talking about the fact that one of them is definitely a Syrian. So what are they going to do with the refugees already in there? There are people in Paris who are using slogans such as, today's immigrant, tomorrow's terrorist. Uh, so there are lots of these challenges we will have to face. Uh, one of the security personnel, or ex-homeland uh, security person on television, uh, spilled the bean that the United States in the US is now monitoring 900 people of interest, which means there are 9,000 FBI agents keeping an eye on 900 Muslims. So there is a tremendous fear, uh, undoubtedly. But what it also does is, it also raises this question of uh, how we talk about Islamophobia. Uh, I mean, why shouldn't Muslims be afraid? I assure you, if I got onto a plane with a lot of Muslims and they were not checked, <laughs> I would be afraid to get on that plane. Uh, I am a Muslim, alhamdulillah, but I'm not stupid. So, so that is the question. Now, would you call me Islamophobic if I refuse to get on a plane with Muslims from Syria and Afghanistan and Sudan and if they are not all checked multiple times? I have small children. I'm not going to take that risk. Now, would that make me Islamophobic is the question. And obviously, this is racial profiling. This is a racial profiling and religious profiling. So that is what these moments do, especially to the Western psyche. This such events, it doesn't matter where it happens today, uh, with the wall-to-wall -wall coverage, 24-7, social media, etc. it's as if it's happening right outside your living room. The reality uh, of these events penetrates uh, into your consciousness, not just with, with a piercing sense, but persistent sense, because it's being lambasted at you all the time. But what also this 24-7 coverage also does is also brings to life all the past events too. So when they don't have anything new to tell you about what's happening in Paris, they will show you clips from 9-11, or clips from the London attacks, or clips from the a Madrid attack or Istanbul attack, and et cetera, et cetera. The conversations, the experts, the speculative theories, et cetera. So it is in the light of this that I want to talk to you about Islamophobia. The second reason why I showed you this video is to tell you what we can do. Okay. This is not my hometown. The, 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 the background that you see is my hotel room. I made this video this afternoon, uh, waiting for Brother Rashid to come and pick me up to come here. Now the message is getting across. I'm reading people comment about it. I just heard that many, uh, I just got an email which says several policy makers have liked it. They want the transcript uh, so they can share it with their staff in the US government. They are distributing it very widely. Uh, I read some of my students writing long responses to this. One of my students wrote a three-page response to this video. It's making him think. That is what we want to do. We want to provide a broader context, a broader context to the conversation about these events. We want people to think more deeply about this event, ask questions beyond who did this, to why it was done, and how can we combat this. That is what a think tank does. That is what a think tank is supposed to do. So I'm like a single walking think tank in front of you. If the same thing had happened in a different context, then you would have Brookings, five people writing the speech, testing out each word, scripting, having lights, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I just moved my chair enough so that the Windows light was enough to record this video. Now, that, that is where you need to have an institution. All Muslim organizations so far are 
basically doing a you know word replace exercise. They have taken their old condemnations and just replaced uh, London with Paris and then issued the same thing out there. There's no substantive comment on it. Because in order for you to make a substantive comment, you need to have substantive thought behind it. And in order to have substantive thought, you need to have a conversation. You need to have a serious dialogue about these issues. Unfortunately, if you're watching television and watching this, you find how few Muslims, if any, are involved in the conversation which matters. Conversation on what to do next. Muslims are there only to apologize and explain. Those Muslims who are getting air time are there only to apologize and explain, but those Muslims who can provide policy analysis, who can provide alternate solutions, uh, do not get air time. Because they might ask questions which we do not want to consider at this time. And that is one of the most important and serious questions uh, for all policymakers. So today I'm going to talk to you about Islamophobia in India and America. I suspect there are many engineers in the, in the house, or at least people who drive cars. Have you ever parked at the signal and then noticed that your car makes a louder noise than it normally does? Have you noticed that? The engine makes a little louder noise than it does? It is because the engine is resonating with the engine next to you. So when two cars come and park, there's a resonance, a mechanical resonance, and you hear a louder noise. What is happening today is the Islamophobia in India and Islamophobia in the US are resonating and magnifying each other. There is a very interesting connection between the two. For example, if you were observant of uh, the kind of venues at which Narendra Modi spoke on his last visit to the United States, and if you bother to ask yourself how he got access to those venues, you will discover that he has tapped into the Islamophobia industry in the US. The industry that is manufacturing and producing Islamophobia in this country is also now helping Narendra Modi fix his image. But not only fix his image, but also export the same notions of Islamophobia as they exist in the US overseas. Uh, but before we decide to explore the political implications, the impact on Muslim life of Islamophobia, and how we can begin to combat this, at least understand this. We need to understand the ph phenomenon of Islamophobia. What is it? If anybody makes a derogatory comment, it is Islamophobic. If one makes a critical comment, it is not Islamophobic. We are in the same dilemma where we have to define whether criticizing Israel constitutes anti-Semitism or not. If your criticism of Israel says, oh, Israel is belligerent because all Jews are blah, 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 that is indeed anti-Semitic. It is not criticism of Israel, but it's anti-Semitic. But if you say that Israeli leaders have promised to make peace, and but since 1993, we have had the Oslo peace process and nothing has happened, that is not critical. That is not anti-Semitism, that is the criticism of Israeli policies. We have to separate the two. So similarly, Muslims need to understand what is Islamophobia and what is not Islamophobia. We need to have that conversation. We can't just bandy the word around casually or loosely because then it will lose its effectiveness. It will lose its academic rigor, and then after that it will lose its political rigor. So one thing that you must recognize is that while there is increasing recognition of the term Islamophobia and the concept of Islamophobia and reality, if you talk to most Americans today, they themselves will be happy to provide you with examples of what they think is Islamophobic in this country. I mean, all you have to say is Ben Carson. Uh, nearly a vast majority of Americans, at least 61% of Americans would consider what Ben Carson said about Muslims being ineligible to be president of the United States as Islamophobic, as prejudicial, if not racist itself. But nevertheless, the idea itself is contested. And we need to understand the boundaries of contestations of the definition of Islamophobia and its political and significant meaning. It is easy to say that Islamophobia is an attitude of malice, an attitude of contempt, an attitude of denigration, of hatred and anger 
towards Islam and Muslims. But I submit to you that today, I would be happy if Islamophobia was merely an attitude. I have lived with lots of attitudes that Muslims have towards me. But when attitude becomes more than that, it becomes political action, then it becomes extremely difficult, dangerous. And we need to challenge that and combat that and push back against it. Today, Islamophobia has become a kind of politics. Islamophobia is a type of politics. For example, if in 2012, if you remember the presidential elections in 2012, uh, nearly every day I would get about, especially starting July, August, I would get many, many phone calls from many reporters, television, radio, etc., both abroad at home, asking me to comment on the Ground Zero mosque controversy. Those of you who remembered, I had written an open letter to Imam Abdul Rauf. Uh, being partly critical of the posture that he had taken and the timing of his announcements. Uh, so that's why I was also getting a lot more attention on this issue. And I had a standard answer. I said, I will speak with, to you extensively, in depth, honestly, I swear, I'll give the entire interview with my hand on the Quran. Call me in November after the elections. They said, what do you mean? I said, because there will be no problem after the election. Now tell me, how many of you know what is happening with Ground Zero Mosque? Nobody knows. <laughs> I don't know whether he raised any money. He had raised only $17,000 when the controversy was breaking out. We don't even know whether the, the builder and Imam Rauf are partners. We're nearly three years away. <laughs> Has there been a groundbreaking ceremony? Nobody cares. It was an issue in the election which helped polarize votes in the country. The Republicans thought that Islamophobia is a good way to garner votes, and so they used it. Once the election was over, nobody cared. Newt Gingrich made big claims about the Ground Zero Mosque. So I called his office and I said, I will sell you the place. He said, what do you mean? I said, I will negotiate with Imam Rauf. You contribute $20 million and we will relocate the place to wherever you want us to build the Ground Zero Mosque. <laughs> they cut the phone off. They didn't want to have any conversation because it was not about the Ground Zero Mosque. It was about how to either mobilize the vote and bring the vote out or how to project to your audience, which is becoming increasingly dumb, that you are truly a conservative. You may remember Mitt Romney struggling to say, I am severely conservative. America is a country of paradoxes. I find it baffling that this is a country where we enjoy the greatest degree of freedom of speech. You can even deny the Holocaust in this country. There are social consequences, but no legal consequences. You can have the freedom of speech to do that. Not in Europe, not in Canada. There's nothing in the United States in terms of speech that is forbidden. And in most disciplines, if you list the top experts, a large chunk of them live in the United States. We have freedom of speech. We have the body of knowledge necessary for a sophisticated discourse. But increasingly, our public discourse is becoming stupider and stupider day by day. Now, that is the shrinking of the quality of public sphere. So we have this paradoxical phenomena in the US where the public sphere is expanding in quantity but shrinking in quality. On the other hand, in India, with the explosion of social media, we also have now a major public sphere where people are free to express themselves. And you see the same Islamophobic rhetoric that you see in, in the United States, they are echoing in India. In 2008, I was invited by the, by the Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis, uh, a major Indian government think tank. I used to be 
in 2008, I was still an Indian citizen, so they wanted to consult me. So I went there, and uh, the keynote address was given by the then Foreign Minister Pranab Mukherjee. And his language was so pathetic and so awful, the way he was talking. It was as if it was Daniel Pipes who was speaking. His language was infused with neocon ideas, neocon terminology, neocon language. And I stood up and asked him, I said, Mr. Foreign Minister, <laughs> Mr. Mukherjee, Americans have discarded these ideas, and you have embraced them? It was a peculiar situation. Uh, George W. Bush's approval ratings were 29 in the US and 54 in India. And the reason why he was popular was because he was bombing Muslims, period. He was bombing Muslims, and he was more popular in India than he was in the US. So what has happened is that in India, a culture where people are culturally very tolerant, the Hindu culture is very broad-minded, very tolerant, very open to diversity, and so on and so forth. They have so much diversity within themselves. Hundreds and thousands of gods, if they can accept them, can you imagine the degree of tolerance they have? Different expressions of religion, different expressions of festivals, and so on and so forth. The Islamophobic discourse in the US is educating the Hindu right in India on how to be Islamophobic. Its implications are very serious because the victims there are much, much more in number and much, much more helpless. So how do we do that? The solution is easy, because it's like saying that if the virus is coming from here, you cut it off at the source. So it is now in the interest of both Indian Muslims and American Muslims to fight Islamophobia on a global level, and especially here in the West. We debunk the Islamophobic rhetoric, debunk the Islamic phobic myths that are generated in the United States and sent abroad. Let me give you an example. Since 2001, after 9-11, do you know how many Americans Muslim terrorists have killed? Can anybody guess? 50, period. And 50 because of that Nadal who went into the, what was that, fort, fort in Texas and shot 13 people there. The number went so far high. Fort Hood. That's 50. Now, all these shootings that you see when Americans walk into schools and churches and shoot, like in South Carolina, this guy who went into a church and shot seven people, if we had classified that particular shooting, mass killing, as terrorism, then non-Muslim Americans have killed 280,000 people in the last 15 years. We in the United States would be the biggest harborer of terrorism and the biggest host to terrorists. Do you know we already have more people in prison than anybody else? There are more people in American prisons than in many countries, and we would have more terrorists in the United States. So it's a matter of classification. When two young girls below the age of 17 buy tickets and fly to Istanbul with the intention of going to Iraq, that is terrorism. But when a man walks into a movie theater and shoots 30, 40 people, it is not. Now, one thing good about this classification is that it's good for my blood pressure. Every time there's an ep episode, I look for key words. The moment they say, in an isolated, I said, of course, it is a white Christian guy who did the killing. And then say, an insane man in an isolated situation for absolutely no political purpose went around on a rampage killing people, then you know it's not a Muslim. Now this is, this whole thing, what is it? I mean, this is a very complicated political ploy. And what I want to submit to you is today, Islamophobia is not just an attitude. It is not just a way of doing politics, like Bobby Jindal, for example. He got so desperate, he started saying stupid things. He is an incredibly smart man. 
He went to Brown, and after he graduated from Brown University, which if you are a high school student, you'll realize is one of the most difficult schools to get admitted to. And after that, he got admitted to Yale Law School and Harvard Medical School, both. So he could have gone to either Harvard Medical School or Yale Law School. He chose to go to Oxford and get a master's in political science because he won the Rhodes Scholarship. He thought he was going to be the next Clinton. Now this smart man <laughs> comes across and says lots of stupid things, partly because he thinks that the people who are going to vote for him are stupid and ignorant, and he won't be caught. And those people who disagree with him, and who also have the knowledge to understand that he is being ignorant, obviously are not his voters anyway. But he went out and asserted in public that the main cities like London, there are no-go zones where jihadis is controlling the cities and imposing Sharia law. If you are a Hindutva activist sitting in India, and you're, if you are slightly smart, they say, wow, creeping Sharia, imposing Sharia. He's right. The Muslims have already done that in India. It's called Muslim personal law. They have constitutionalized it already in India. So why is he wrong when he says that wherever Muslims go, they are going to bring creeping Sharia? They've already done this in India. Now you have to challenge the notion here and say, how come Muslims, who are less than 1% of this population, impose the entire Sharia on 320 million Americans, when nearly 300 million Christians could not impose two rules of the Christian Sharia on the rest of the country, such as prohibiting gay marriage and stopping abortions. If 300 million Christians can't get two things done, how are we able to get Muslims? I don't know, after the age of the Khulafah Rashidin, whether we ever implemented the whole Sharia in our own countries when we were in full majority. Turkey is a 99% Muslim country. They like to call it that. And if you use the word Sharia in the politics, you go to jail. How can Muslims impose Sharia? But this rhetoric is designed not to generate facts to inform or analyze. This rhetoric is designed to generate fear, to incite anger, to spawn insecurity, and make people frightened of Muslims. Nearly half the states in this country are in the process of or are already trying to make Sharia illegal in the United States. Everybody knows. In some of the states, there are hardly any Muslims. So why are they going through this entire exercise of passing a law which has absolutely no purpose? Because it allows them to conduct a discourse in which they can talk about Muslims as threats. And all other means that they want, Muslims get coming in with illegal aliens from Mexico and so on and so forth. And same rhetoric in India. All these people that you see in Assam are illegal alien Muslims coming from Burma. You can see the resonance of the Islamic phobic discourse on both sides. So Islamophobia is not just an attitude, it's not a, just a malicious position, it is a way of doing politics. In India it has been a very old case. Not only do Hindus indulge in what I call as Islamophobic politics, but Muslims also do. All Islamic parties do that. The success of Muslim politics is based on Islamophobia. If there is no Islamophobia in India, Islamic parties will not be successful. And vice versa too. Islamophobia also triggers by creating religion-based vote banks. So the same politics which divides Hindus and Muslims also creates the Hindu vote bank and simultaneously creates the Muslim vote bank. When the Congress began creating the Muslim world, Muslim vote bank, it laid the seeds for the creation of the Hindu World Bank. It's like every action has a natural and opposite reaction. So what, do, what is going to happen as a result of that? I fear that Islamophobia will become institutionalized across the world. If there are changes in European policies of accepting refugees, there will be new re redefinition of what constitutes asylum 
and who can get asylum. All of that will be de designed keeping Muslims in mind. That's what institutionalized Islamophobia would be. Institutionalized discrimination is like talking about racism without races. You don't need people with prejudice to have prejudicial actions. You, the institution does it for you. Like you could go, if you are an Ahmadi, to the nicest man in the embassy in Pakistan or in Saudi Arabia and say, I want to go for Hajj. And this wonderful person will look at your passport and he says you're not a Muslim and he will not be able to give you the visa. I wonder what they would do if he says, I want to go there and take Shahada while I'm doing my Hajj. <laughs> I don't know. This doesn't occur to people, I guess. They'll just shun them out. That is institutionalized, legalized discrimination. So what kinds of Islamophobias do you see manifest out there? Now, one of the biggest challenges and the biggest problems for Muslims is that Islamophobia is going mainstream. Now, what we mean mainstream is that not some joker pundit in some corner or some RSS uh, activist in a chaddi is making Islamophobic comments, but it is the prime minister who is making Islamophobic comments. In the United States, most of the anti-Muslim rhetoric comes from people who have aspirations to be the leader of the free world. Mike Huckabee called Muslims uncorked animals. Newt Gingrich compa compared Islam to Nazis. It was, to me, quite fascinating. I really wanted to get into a debate with Newt Gingrich. Never got a chance. Newt Gingrich is a convert to Catholicism. If there was any religion connected to the Holocaust and the Nazis, it was Catholic faith. And Newt Gingrich is a PhD in history. He was a professor of history. He knows this. And yet he goes out and keeps saying Nazism and Islam because Sheldon Adelson was giving him millions of dollars. Then it was apparent to everybody that this man is going nowhere. Adelson still kept him going by giving him money so that he could spout the venom that he was spouting. There are no people like the Palestinians. Islam is like a cult and Nazism and so on and so forth. But by making that, those Americans who did not listen, who do not know Muslims, who have not read about Islam, don't know the wonderful history of Muslims, we, were, we invented chemistry and algebra. Sometimes I feel that that's why Americans hate us, because they are afraid of algebra and chemistry. <laughs> because we invented those things. <laughs> But nevertheless, nobody knows. They just listen to Newt Gingrich, who could have been president, and it imbibes. They just absorb that kind of prejudicial thing. And then in India, Indian politicians see and say, Agar America kar raha hai, to hum kyun kar sakte? That is the position. Agar America kar raha hai, to hum kyun kar sakte? I mean, America is the moral standard of the world, isn't it? So if Americans can say this, why can't we say it? And we have real proof. Ye to bekhuf hai. Hamare paas to sabut hai, tarikh hai. And that is how this is beginning to fade into each other. So as far as Muslims are concerned, whether they are in India or in America, I think one thing that we can all work together on is combating Islamophobia everywhere. Okay. But I have another fear, which is even if we combat Islamophobia at the level of the institution, I fear that it will be internalized. I had a very interesting experience when I was studying as a student at Georgetown. Because I don't drink, I get into very interesting situations where I'm the only person who has not had a beer or anything, and everybody has had a few. And I discovered that in this country, anti-Semitism is two beers away. That's it. Two beers and <laughs> the language is different. And suddenly they say, I understand your pain, brother. I said, what is my pain? <laughs> oh, the Palestinian cause and they and they and it begins to come out. And these are the people who otherwise are very strong Zionists themselves and supporting the cause of Israel and bombastic, etc. But a couple of drinks and then boom, it comes out. So what I'm trying to tell you is that could happen with Islamophobia too, where 
a duration of institutionalization people will internalize. It's like racism. Racism in this country is not just internalized, it is part of the DNA of the culture. It's not easy to remove that. Islamophobia is not there yet. Alhamdulillah. I hope it doesn't get there, but it could become internalized if there is sustained institutionalized application of Islamophobia. Even in India, it is superficial. Even in India, it is superficial. Which means that it can be sanitized. But if it, is, if it is sustained at an institutional level, then it will become internalized. And the biggest danger for Islamophobia in India is the emerging segregation of people. More and more people are becoming segregated. So now you can ask young people, and oh, do you have any Hindu friends? No. When was the last time you celebrated Diwali and people look at you crazy? Last night, uh, two nights ago when I came here, when I was landing in Chicago, Chicago looks fabulous when it's clear and the lights like all over, lights, blah, blah, blah. So I took a picture. You can see it's on my Facebook page. So I took the picture of all the lights. And then I was looking at it. Sometimes I talk to myself in many languages. Sometimes I talk to myself in Arabic, sometimes in English, sometimes in Urdu. So I was saying, wow, kya nazara hai, diye hi diye. And then I suddenly remembered that I had not wished people happy Diwali. So I just put my status there saying, you <laughs> Pharaoh saw it. Happy Diwali, the lights of Chicago. And so I know that all Hindi speaking people understood what I'm trying to say. And last night I had the pleasure of meeting a lot of my Muslim friends from Hyderabad after 28 years. They haven't seen me for 28 years, and the first thing they do is call me for wishing people happy Diwali. I told him, wait, let Hanuka come. I'm going to write a poem. Okay, <laughs> I'll, he'll probably die, and that will be my revenge. Uh, but what is interesting is it was shocking to me because I have celebrated Diwali with this specific individual in Hyderabad who's a Muslim, but we had Hindu common friends. So what is happening is people are segregating themselves. What segregation does is it does not provide empirical evidence to contest stereotypes. Like if someone tells you that Muslims have three eyes and a horn, if you have not met a Muslim, you can't verify that. So you have to have a personal experience. I said, what do you mean? I know I have many Muslim friends and I've checked. Nobody has a horn, and obviously there are only two eyes unless they have one hidden. Okay? You do know that we have more than two eyes, right? We see from the heart. Okay? The Rasulullah sallallahu according to all sahabas, saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from his heart. So we do have another eye. So what is happening now, also because of social media, is discourses. The way we talk about things. Memes the cartoons, the pictures that we make and send around. Political strategies are all becoming globally portable. If it works in Louisiana, why can't it work in Lucknow? There's a professor here at Brown University called Ashutosh Varshne. He, he wrote an award-winning book about why Muslims and Hindus do not riot in Lucknow while they riot in Hyderabad. Okay, very similar cities, basically Muslim culturally Muslim, 20% Muslim, 80% Hindu. So why do Muslims and Hindus fight each other in Hyderabad, but they don't do that in Lucknow? And he came up with a very interesting argument. He says because they are economically intertwined. The biggest business in Lucknow is exporting chicken ka kurta. You know what that is, right? Lucknowi kurta that we call. Now he found that there are four major processes making the yeah making the string and then, then taking the yarn and then making a cloth and then taking the cloth and stitching it and then marketing it so those four stages but they alternate Muslims and Hindus alternate in specializing each of that 
So for every Hindu businessman, he is vendor from whom he is getting supplies, and his buyer whom he is selling the finished good is a Muslim. And the same for a Muslim too, because of the layers. So it was a beautiful book, great art, he got a big award, etc. But by the time the book came out, there was a riot in here. <laughs> in Lucknow, between Muslims, that was the BJP effect. So ideology and discourses were able to under undermine even economic integration. Now what is happening in India is not just economic disintegration, but also socio-cultural segregation. And that is, I think, one of the biggest problems. And what is going to happen is that, that Indians might export that to Muslims and to the US, and that, to me, is a very frightening thing. In order to understand and combat Islamophobia, therefore, we have to understand the global and local nexus. Uh, I think uh, Brother Rashid used the word macro and micro, it's very similar. What I'm trying to say is that what is global about Islamophobia needs to be fought at a global level. And what is local about Islamophobia needs to be fought at the local level. If we misuse the strategies, we'll make things worse. So what is global? Global is the discourse about Muslims as bad citizens when they are minorities, unworthy of trust. That Muslims are the source of global terrorism, which is not factually true. <coughs> They're just good at it. Because they have less incidences but more casualties. So this whole idea that Muslims are not good citizens, unreliable citizens of nation states, that Muslims are terrorists, Muslims give preference to their religion, et cetera, et cetera, all of these parts, these th discursive themes which are global need to be fought at a global level. But the strategies are different. Banning Sharia is one way of implementing Islamophobia in the US, whereas banning beef is how they are doing that in India. Do you know that India exports beef, and the exports of beef from India has actually increased after Modi became the Prime Minister of India? So Modi has no problems if Americans eat his god. As long as the Muslims are not eating his god, he's okay. Come on, yaar. You know, I'm sure he would have also enjoyed it. Who can't enjoy a burger? Okay. So what are the consequences of this phenomenon? The consequences are very dire. One, it is going to generate fear among Muslims too. So the internalization of Islamophobia will be something that even Muslims will internalize. To give you an example, if you are a Muslim in a position of power, you will be careful not to hire Muslims. Because you will say, and that's how they say it in Hyderabad, right? <laughs> Why should I get into this little hassle of justifying the fact that this is genuinely a good candidate? Let's avoid him. So what happens is that anticipation of Islamophobia and preemptive actions by Muslims to preserve themselves from being accused of being communal will be a form of internal, internalizing Islamophobia, and they will become Islamophobic institutionally. I remember the first time I went to London. I was going back from the US to India. I had never been to London. And I wanted to take, I had a 24-hour break, so I just wanted a 20-hour visa, and I thought I would go. And I was younger, I was thinner, I had hair then. You should remember that before I finish the story. Yes, I was younger, I had hair, and I was thinner. You remember that, <laughs> yeah. But now I have a deal with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever he does, I accept it. In the hope that whatever I do, he will also accept it. <laughs> so he made me bald, etc. So while I was there, I got friendly with a Sikh. The, the, the counter for visas had not yet opened. And there was a Sikh mopping the floor. I started talking to Kigal Sadaji and so on and so forth. So then he found out my situation. So he said, I'm going to tell you, I give you a tip. When the visa things open, if you see a desi, don't go. I said, why? 
ही सेट कहीं तुम चले जाओगे थिंकिंग अपना बंदा है वो ही तुम्हें वीजा नहीं देगा एंड देन ही सेट देखने में तो अच्छे हो कोई मेम के पास चले जाओ आई सेट वाई नाथ एंड सो द थिंग ओपन एंड नाउ आई एम डूइंग इनी मिनी माइनी मो there were like 10 counters there were four indian looking people indians pakistanis bangladeshis i didn't know i didn't want to know there was only one white woman there so i went to her <laughs> remember i had hair in those days and i was not fat so she said what can i do for you what do you want i said i want a 24 hour transit visa she said i'm not going to give it i said well make it 16 hours then she said why i said i'll stand here till you get free then when you're done i can go with you and then you can bring me back tomorrow morning just to ensure that we are back that way i see london and you see my back she loved that she said, oh that's good go you give me the visa but what was interesting to me was this conversation with this sick and i remember that because he must have experienced that many many times himself that every time he went to an indian pakistani or an immigrant desi type person he's a, he was treated badly and what had happened was that the middle and lower middle classes had internalized racism which was endemic to the british society and i fear that that is what is going to happen both in india and the united states that muslims themselves will then internalize islamophobia and they will become the purveyors of of discrimination against their own people that is one of the biggest challenges the second is insecurity this country do you know that there are more guns than people in the united states and i'm not counting the guns that police and military have not counting the guns that the police and the military have the guns that ordinary civilians have there are nearly three guns per person no other country is there like Switzerland etc is maybe like 30% three for like 30 for 100 people are here now if you have indian style hatred of muslims in the us can you imagine what the gun violence can do a man in sweden less than 2 weeks ago dressed up in a halloween costume walked into a school with a sword and they thought that he was be you know just wearing a costume because it was halloween so people actually took pictures with the guy and then he went berserk he just went after dark skinned people asked them their religion and started killing them when i think he killed three or four people the swedes are paranoid swedes thought that they were the most liberal the most tolerant the most open country they took the largest number of syrian refugees this year 66000 which for a tiny country like sweden will completely alter its demographics within a year and they have also now engendered islamophobic racism etc the third consequence is political marginalization islamophobia will essentially mean that people will not take you remember hillary clinton last time took all returned all the money that muslim gave to her when she ran for the senate if you remember that i'm going to keep bringing it up again and again i wrote a piece in al jazeera recently in which i mentioned it so if you want to cite you that's where to cite i remember asking her does it mean madam clinton that you do not represent the muslims of new york who senator you are is that what you're trying to say even though you live in my state i will not represent you is that the message so that is an important thing for us to lesson that even in india islamophobia will become politically marginalized muslims i don't know whether you know of this episode in in bangalore where rss activists or bjp activists went around pretending to be census and were basically destroying the voter cards of indians basically trying to reduce indian muslims from voting in the next coming election so there will be attempts to marginalize there will be economic hardship and loss of opportunities because people will start giving jobs and doing businesses based on the person's religion not his competence if you start like it's like saying that oh my god we need to reduce 10% of the people we need to fire 10% of our staff and then saying kitne muslim hai knock all the muslims out first before you downsize the company would you like to see something like that happening so that is one of my fear that in in essential non skilled areas 
there could be an economic downturn in which Muslims could be treated very badly. How do you understand the fundamental difference? Now, this is an important thing. Uh, I was telling Rashid Sawa, I've been teasing him for the last two hours, saying that I'm going to make an important point, uh, and it's very important that people here get it. What is the difference between American Muslims and Indian Muslims who both face very similar situations? Indian Muslims are a minority in the world's biggest democracy. American Muslims are a religious minority in the world's greatest and oldest democracy. We are both living in secular states, which allow to a great extent for us to support and manifest our religious practices, etc. I submit to you that American Muslims are economically developed and politically underdeveloped. Look at this. This is Chicago, a city with 200,000. How many Indian Muslims are there in the city? 450,000 Muslims, but Indian Muslims at least 100,000? Yeah, either they don't care. Frankly, either they don't care, too many akhikhas, more important than caring for the future of Islam and Muslims in India, or they're not convinced of this mission. Whatever it is, even if they're not convinced of the mission, they don't want to lose their pretty dollars, they should come and at least give us a chance to explain what we are trying to do. That is a sign of very narrow-minded, selfish, politically stupid thinking. I guarantee you, if one of these lights was gone and I said we need to replace the chandelier and it's worth 400,000, we would have probably raised it tonight. That is science of backward thinking. Because how will we protect if people walk in and destroy all these chandeliers in the mosque? Where will we get the clout to protect these institutions? How can we call our senators and our congressmen and the sheriff of police and say, we fear the security of this mosque, we want you to protect it? That comes with political clout, with political engagement, with political involvement. In Delaware, we have about 6,000 people who attend the mosque, uh, eat prayers. So we bring all the politicians to see the eat prayer, and their mouth starts watering to see 6,000 voters, even if 10% of them give money, that is 600 checks, blah, blah, blah. But we are afraid to take the next step, is to find out how many of these have actually registered to vote. Okay? And I'm the guy who's stopping them. I said, yeah, Akhi, if you find out that only 200 Muslims have registered to vote, no politician in the state will ever talk to us again. <laughs> right? Let them think there are 6,000 of us. Who knows how many have green cards, how many are citizens, how many are illegal, <laughs> how many are just visiting. Who knows? I don't care. Let them think is there are 6,000 people. Yes, there are 6,000 in the Salah. Maybe there are 6,000 Muslims who are politically active. So what is important is that American Muslims are economically developed. Our per capita income is probably more than $75,000 per year. We are, probably, we are definitely richer than America. American Muslims are definitely richer than America. American Muslims are definitely more educated than America in terms of per capita education, per capita wealth, etc. So if we just took American Muslims together, put together, we might be one of the top five or six advanced countries in the world. And we are winning Nobel Prizes. The Nobel Peace Prize is only for two people, Democratic presidents and Muslims. Go back and look, okay, on the, all these years. But scientific Nobel Prizes too, for cure, okay. So, but Indian Muslims are politically developed but economically backward. They are exactly the opposite of us. They vote, they participate in politics. If we did a session like that, then there'll be like thousands of people sitting on the floor and Nare, Takbir, Allah, all kinds of fun going to a Jalsa in India, political or otherwise. Right? They're politically engaged, they understand the importance, they turned on in Bihar, what an incredible thing you see across the world. Uh, you see, I'm good friends with 
us at the OAC on Facebook and Twitter, and we keep exchanging, and he keeps writing all these wonderful responses. He's going wherever he's going. The Muslims seem to be so politically mobilized. They don't even have chapel sometimes. <laughs> We have Mercedes, but we don't go for these events, but people with barefoot are going and participating. So American Muslims are economically developed, politically underdeveloped. Indian Muslims are politically developed and economically underdeveloped. If you both come together, we will form one good community. Right? If you both come together, we can form one full community. And that is what, what is the role, I think, of USIPI, to bring, hopefully, the Three things, the expertise that American Muslims have, the access that we have to the global public sphere because of our presence in Washington, D.C., because we are in the U.S., we are in the capital, or at least in the empire. This is the empire. The second thing is that we have the freedom to do whatever we like politically. Third, we have the money to put our money where our mouths are. And we can therefore provide a, a think tank where both local strategies to combat Islamophobia, how to combat Islamophobia in France, how to combat Islamophobia in India, can be generated here. And global strategies challenging global discourses can be done from here. A press conference in Washington, D.C. with two senators and a few congressmen can have a global impact all over the world. And that is why it's important for us to have an institution like USIPI to combat Islamophobia at the global level and then develop strategies. And one final point. We can't merge the two communities. American Muslims are American Muslims, Indian Muslims are Indian Muslims, which means that if we can develop Indian Muslims economically, and balance their economic development with their political development, then they will be a force for themselves. Thank you very much.